our panelists tonight. As some of you may know, transportation accounts for almost 30% of man-made emissions in the United States. Decarbonizing the ways in which we move around and the ways in which we move goods around is critical to reducing, reducing emissions and mitigating the impacts of climate change. The overarching question that we are discussing here tonight is how do we create a transportation ecosystem in which all mobility is accessible, reliable, and renewable? This is particularly challenging in the US where more than 90% of households rely on, rely on cars to get around. And while electrifying vehicles is a key component to a sustainable transportation ecosystem, it is not the only solution to sustainable mobility as you will hear from our panelists tonight. Um, and our panelists are experts in transportation, in policy, as well as in problem solving. Um, our first panelist that I'm gonna introduce is Kate Fitz Kate Fitcher. She is an associate principal and America's East transportation decarbonization leader based in Arup's Boston office. She has deep experience in public transportation, sustainable mobility modes, and policies from having spent her career in state and federal government. Our next panelist, Janelle London, is a co executive director of Cultura a nonprofit advocating for a quick transition away from fossil fuel powered mobility to cleaner alternatives. She's a former lawyer who has authored several articles promoting policies that would accelerate the move away from fossil fuels. And interestingly has even written a children's story to educate about the harms of gasoline. Uh, our next panelist is Robin Marquise. She is the Director of Innovative Mobility at CalSTART. She has deep experience at CalSTART and in her previous role at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, overseeing initiatives that make zero emission and mobility affordable and accessible while also reducing vehicle miles traveled. And our last panelist joining us tonight is John Reister, who is the founder and CEO of Go Power EV a full service EV charging company focused on EV infrastructure at multifamily housing. Uh, he is an early advocate for the transition to EVs and, and brings together his technology background, his problem solving skills and passion for innovation to incorporate equity and affordability into the EV ecosystem. Um, I would also like to note that uh, John is currently hiring. So if you are interested in working in um, a sustainable mobility solution, I um, encourage you to, to reach out to John. Uh, lastly, uh, I, I have to uh, introduce my uh, Global Sustainability Network colleague, uh, Daniel Lee. Uh, Dan Lee is moderating tonight's panel. Uh, he's a CIS graduate uh, who is a key member of our leadership team. And in addition to uh, serving on our leadership team. He's also a leader in the uh, NorCal chapter of the Columbia Alumni Association, a member of the Columbia Alumni Association's Leadership Development Subcommittee. Um, he is an EV convert who believes we must act now to mitigate the disastrous effects of climate change and doesn't understand why everybody else isn't doing something to change this outcome. So without further ado, I will pass the virtual mic to my colleague, Dan. Thank you, Jamie. Hi, I'm Dan Lee, and I will be moderating tonight's discussions. First, I would like to acknowledge all of you for joining, joining us this evening. Whether it's a conviction to help fight the climate crisis or simply a desire to learn, I know every one of you has a good reason to be here tonight. For me, having lived in California for the past 15 years, I've seen the weather patterns becoming more extreme year after year. And I just know that if we don't do something about it, there won't be much of a future for our children or theirs. A couple of months ago, I attended an event that was hosted by Kotura. And during the event, I learned a powerful story about why my friend Janelle London developed her conviction. Um, so Janelle, could you please share with the group 
why you wanted to help decarbonize transportation? Sure, Dan, thank you for that. Yeah, that was a very fun event and I'm so glad you were there. Um, so my story, how I came to be doing this work is that I started as an attorney at a large law firm and I got kidney failure. So I had to go on dialysis. I was on a machine three times a week, four hours um, at a time. And that sort of changed my focus. Um, I realized that I was starting to feel compelled to help other dialysis patients. So I left the practice of, of, of law, quickly got a kidney transplant, uh, which I still have today, 24 years later, and um, started doing work for a Fortune 500 dialysis company, helping patients. And that felt pretty fulfilling, but after 15 years, I felt like I kind of maxed out on that, and I was becoming more and more aware of the climate crisis. And our daughters were asking me, Mom, what are you doing about the climate crisis? And um, I just, I thought, you know what, I actually need to be focused on the climate crisis. So I, I made a very abrupt decision to leave my very good job. And um, I set aside what I called my eco decade. I like to be very intentional. So I said, I'm going to do take 10 years and make the biggest difference on climate that I possibly can. You know, I have this legal background, but otherwise I'm completely unqualified to do anything about climate. So I figured I better take a year off to do some research and figure out what, where was the opportunity for me to actually make a difference. Um, and in my research, I found that gasoline was this major fossil fuel, a huge portion, you know, one sixth of all of our US carbon emissions that its use just wasn't going down. And about that time, I was telling everybody I knew about this and somebody said, hey, you know, um, well, it was Dan Lee, what am I saying? Dan introduced me, he said, there's this nonprofit, Cultura, that's um, focused on gasoline. You might want to talk to them. So he connected me up with that group. Um, I met the executive director and said, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe you guys are coming to the same conclusion that gasoline is this problem that nobody's doing anything about. I want to join you full time. So um, that's how I got with Cultura. And since then, I'm happy to say that my um, the eco decade is turning out really well. Um, I've gotten to achieve far more than I ever thought possible, including that we've passed some some uh, big laws and enacted some big policies that have made a difference that I think we'll be talking about later. Thank you, Janelle. So you know, so um, for the benefit of the audience, could you share with us why you know? So what's the urgency? Why is this so 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 urgent for us to act? Yeah, um, I, I can. If I can share my screen, I'll share um, something that helps illustrate it. Let's see. I want to do slideshow. Uh, hmm. Okay, for some reason, I am not getting the option. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Okay, so this, this slide uh, looks wonky, but it's kind of uh, identifies the urgency. So um, scientists from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have said that we need to cut emissions uh, roughly in half from all sources by 2030. Um, a lot of folks are focused on kind of long-term emissions reductions and phasing out sales of gas cars eventually, that sort of thing. But we also have this very important near-term deadline. Um, and 2030, as you guys well know, is seven years away. So um, this is kind of what we have to do. So the, the red line is what we need to do. And the blue line is what we're forecast to do in terms of global carbon emissions. Um, and with gasoline in the US being one sixth of all carbon emissions, it kind of needs to do its fair share. So this is the drastic drop that we need to, to make happen that so far is not, not really happening. So, so Janelle, um, help us understand what, so what happens? I mean, if and when, we obviously hope it doesn't happen, but uh, you know, if the climate clock hits zero, you know, for lack of a better term, what, what happens? Um, you know, it's it's not like there's one black and white answer to that question. It's extremely nuanced and variable depending on our beautiful planet. So we don't actually know when we'll hit certain tipping points. I mean, there are some who say we've already hit some tipping points, but we know that to avoid the very worst impact of, uh, of climate change, uh, we need to do our very best to really drive down the burning of fossil fuels, to cut emissions. 
Um, so I, I can't say for sure, you know, will we all go up in flames? I mean, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change um, pretty much everywhere across, at everywhere that everyone's from who's on this, this uh, webinar today, um, from fires to heat waves to big storms and so on. Thank you, Janelle. Um, so <clears throat> coming back to um, to to e-mobility, um, we all know that carbon emissions is a major cause uh, for the climate crisis. And, and since transportation is the number one source of emissions, um, clearly e-mobility is the way to go. But what do we mean when we're when we talk about e-mobility? Um, I would like to open this uh, question to the panel, please. Perhaps start with uh, Robin. Sure, happy to jump in. Um, I think particularly because I'm working in a, in a mobility position, for me, e-mobility might mean something different from some uh, private companies, for example, that have an e-mobility division where they're really hyper-focused on electric vehicles. Um, in my world, it's really, and, and we do, I would say broadly zero emission. So um, it includes some hydrogen as well, but looking at the E, the electric part of this, um, really trying to increase access to all electrified modes, whether that's a bike, whether that's a car, a shuttle, a bus, a train, a ferry, <laughs> everything else that I, maybe I haven't touched on here. So I think it's, it's um, trying to increase uh, access to the different modes and what that access means, but doing so in modes that are um, electric or zero emission. Thank you, Robin. And what about John and Kate? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, obviously bikes and scooters. Um, I just want to give a nod to plug in hybrids. So people who are, you know, concerned about range and they're worried and don't have the ability to charge at home, you know, plug-in hybrids is where you go electric for 30, 40, 50 miles, and then the car switches over to gasoline. And the cars do tend to be a little more expensive, and they have higher higher maintenance costs, but uh, I do think that uh, if you can go the first 40 miles on electric, you're, you're tackling a big part of the, uh, the mileage. Thank you, John. And, and Kate? So I guess just a couple of things. Um, so I, I really, I, I came to the climate world sort of via the transportation world. And I, I always <laughs> feel the need to say at the beginning that um, you, it, every one of these discussions starts with somebody saying something like the transportation sector is responsible for somewhere between like 20 and 40% of whether it's local or national or global carbon emissions. And I always like to clarify and say, it's it's not, it's not transportation. Transportation itself should not be demonized. Mobility is actually an incredibly important part of a well-functioning society. The problem is the fuels that we use and the amount that we have to drive using those fuels. Um, so I just, I always want to be like, yay, transportation. Like we want to keep moving around. It's just how we do it. Um, I actually approach sort of e-mobility from an, an even broader perspective. And maybe this is how we talk about it on the East Coast and maybe this is not correct, but um, we have treated the idea of e-mobility as basically sort of anything that's innovative. So scooters fall into that. Um, you know, electric bikes, all three classes, electric vehicles. I, I tend to be more in favor of pushing the idea of like low, lower, lowest emission. I think, you know, telling every, everybody that everything has to be zero emission right from the get-go is going to be really hard to get to and I think overwhelms people. I also really think that plugins are a great credit bridge solution um, and something that we should be talking about more. And they're also apparently more readily available at this point, given all the supply chain screw ups. Um, so I, so to me, E is kind of like everything that is new as a way to get around, many of which are electric powered, um, but it can be everything from a pickup truck that runs on electricity to a scooter that, you know, fits one person. Um, so it's, it's a wide range and the word sort of, to me, combines both like innovation and electric. Yes, absolutely. I would love to, you know, one of my dreams is to actually see the Staten Island Ferry become electric. Um, anyways, um, <clears throat> thank you for that, Kate. Um, now I'd like to 
um, look at e-mobility um, on a regional basis across the U.S. Um, and my question is, you know, how do, do the differences in regional po population density and commuting patterns affect the way that we or you prioritize e-mobility options in different parts of the U.S.? Um, can I ask John to start with uh, this um, this question? Uh, yeah, sure. And I, I'm going to share a slide if you can see that. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of highlight that 90% of your trips are actually within 30 miles of home. And um, so I think that's, you know, kind of a critical factor when thinking about, I, I, I think most people think about EV and EV charging as the key is, you know, how do you get the electric gas station to drive your two, three, 400 mile trip? But yeah, the vast majority of your driving is actually, you know, around, around your home going to and from work and shopping and so on. And so um, it turns out 80% of all charging ends up taking place at home because of that. And actually that's across all miles. And if you just look at people who have the ability to charge at home, it's actually 91% of all charging happens at home. So anyway, uh, the rest of this slide is a little bit about the, the uh, other parts of GoPower EV. But I just wanted to highlight that um, really the focus is, uh, I think, the most important thing in terms of, you know, um, what the driving patterns are that are, are you know, uh, significant here. I think the fact that so much of that mobility is happening uh, relatively close to home uh, just highlights the importance of being able to charge at home. And then what we're about is, um, you know, a lot of people live in multifamily and, uh, and Hence, uh, hence need to have that uh, capability. Thank you, John. Um, Robin, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, so John highlighted a lot of uh, proximity to home base um, for, for, for charging needs. I think there's a lot of parallels to um, mobility options as well, where the majority of trips that people are taking um, are under three miles and uh, sort of like there's a percentage that are under five, then under three, then under one. So if you look at the feasibility of, of mode shifting or replacing some of those with the various modes and their capabilities, um, sort of to, to Kate's point on light and lighter and lightest, um, there are some that could be replaced with even, you know, your own two feet. Uh, I walk a lot <laughs> or a human powered bike. Um, and then as you add some uh, electric capabilities, particularly for the different classes of e-bikes, then that helps if there's any sort of uh, hills that you're encountering, or you're going to be biking in um, heat waves that we have been having more frequently, unfortunately. Um, but I think What's really going to be interesting to follow uh, as things are continuing still to adapt and emerge in a, I don't know, still kind of COVID, but coming out of it, out of primary pandemic phase is how commuting patterns are continuing to shift and how people's behaviors um, also changed uh, during that time. There's a huge uptick in uh, bike usage in particular. E-bikes are, are outselling EVs um, by a significant factor and there's more incentive programs for them as well. Um, so I, I think trying to capitalize on that momentum is the challenge for, for folks like me and Kate and others that are, are working in the broader um, mode space because we have also seen um, VMT rebounding to pre-lockdown and even more. Um, so people are still driving a fair amount. The reasons why or where or how they're doing so may have shifted a bit, but capitalizing on um, telework and other commuting options, um, there's definitely an opportunity as in particular more e-bike models and incentives for them become more widely available. 
But thank you, Robin. Yes, I mean, there's clearly clearly, clearly a, a difference um, when we look at um, sort of options for the, um, uh, the East Coast versus um, the West Coast. Um, my, my, and now I would like to take a deeper dive um, on the problems uh, at, at hand. Um, and um, my next question for the panelists is, you know, when you are, when you've been, you know, trying to implement e-mobility, uh, whether it's on the East Coast or the West Coast, what what have been the main obstacles that you have faced? Um, I'd like to open this to the panel, um, perhaps starting with John, because I believe John also has, has slides for this one as well. Yeah, I, I uh, kind of go back to start with that slide I was sharing. And um, so uh, the number one obstacle for adopting um, you know, an EV is the ability to charge. Um, that's the number one concern that people have is, is whether they can charge at home. And um, so uh, what I found, you know, when I was founding my company, I was volunteering at a nonprofit and uh, people would come in. And it was a, a community outreach uh, group and people would come in and say, I live in a multifamily apartment building and uh, you know, some people would, like, I got a plug-in hybrid, and in order to plug it in, I got a 100-foot extension cord from Home Depot. I plug it in uh, in, my, in my kitchen. I open the window over my sink. I drop the extension cord out the window, and that's how I, I plug in my car. Um, so anyway, I was hearing that, and that, you know, there were these problems in multifamily. And so that's what um, what we ended up doing is coming up with a low cost, um, affordable way for people to be able to charge at home when they're in multifamily. And our, our capability is that everybody can have their own charging port. So instead of having to share, uh, everybody gets their own charging port. Um, and then uh, another part of the challenge um, is the stress that it puts on the grid and uh, supercharging like highway charging, the, the, the challenge with supercharging, um, uh, by the way, it's, it's fundamental and critical to have supercharging available. So don't get me wrong on that. And people won't buy EVs if they can't drive from, you know, uh, New York to, uh, to Washington and charge along the way. Um, however, supercharging, people are very inflexible when you're pulling over to charge, you don't want to charge, you know, four hours from now, you want to charge right then. And you're trying to get as much electricity as fast as possible. So you get this big uh, spike in demand and you're very inflexible in time shifting that. And one of the benefits of charging at home is you plug it in at, you know, six, seven, eight PM and it charges overnight. Um, you might not leave until, you know, middle of the next day. And so you have the ability to time shift that around. Uh, same thing at work, right? So you generally have a little bit of flexibility to shift it around. So uh, it's much better if we can get, you know, charging at home and, uh, and at work and, uh, and use that. And that's, you know, much easier on the grid. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. And, uh, okay. Th and thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, John. I would like to uh, pass the mic, so to speak, to, to Janelle before asking our East Coast panelists to address this question. Thanks, Dan. So, Janelle, uh, what's been like the number one obstacle for you? Yeah. Okay. Cultura? So at Cultura, we are laser focused on a question framed much the way Kate uh, pointed to. Is the question is, how can we reduce gasoline use the fastest? And so we look at Who's using the most gasoline? Who would have the biggest impact if they switched to an EV? And so we um, started looking at who, who are the biggest gasoline users. And there was no data out there about that at all, nothing on gasoline consumption. So anyway, we did a lot of research, um, combined tens of millions of DMV vehicle records and a bunch of other data sets and figured out who and where these biggest gasoline users are. And we defined the top people who are using the most gasoline as super users. And I can just tell you that on average, they're using 1,200 gallons of gas a year versus a non-super user at 354 gallons a year. So the difference is extreme. So if you can get one super user into an EV, that's a lot bigger impact than somebody who's not a super user. And so our biggest challenge is 
helping governments understand that gasoline reduction is the ultimate metric and getting them to think that way. So right now, governments are thinking in terms of like their key metric is number of EVs. California has a goal to get 5 million EVs on the road with zero regard for how much gasoline that's going to displace. Um, and so if we can get governments to think that way, um, that, that's one of our biggest challenges. The other one is to help super users understand the amazing financials of switching to an EV. So you'll hear in the news, oh, EVs are too expensive. Uh, no one can afford them. The average EV is what, whatever, such and such a price. For gasoline super users, on average, they're spending $500 a month on gasoline and another $300 on maintenance and repairs. So with that $800 of monthly costs they're already carrying, they can easily shift. If they, if they could redirect that spending towards a monthly EV car payment and electricity, in a lot of cases, they could come out ahead from, from day one. Um, and if they trade in their gas car, a lot of times that covers the, the down payment. Um, and so our other biggest challenge is helping them understand the amazing economics of how it's so worth it to switch. Um, they just don't see it that way. And so we're trying to help them. So those are probably our two biggest challenges. And I will say super users, you know, they, they drive on average 24,000 miles a year. That's a lot. Um, but, in, but most of them are driving under, say, 150, 200 miles a day, you know, a range that could very easily, I'm going to say really under 100 miles a, a day, a range that could very easily be covered by pretty much any EV on the market today. So that's, I guess, one more challenge, just helping them understand that most of them are doing this because they're living where it's affordable and commuting a very long distance to where the jobs are. Um, and even that's a very long distance is still within the range of an EV. So they actually could meet their driving needs. That's that's the final challenge. Thank you, Janelle. And um, what about on the East Coast? Um, Robin, Kate? Go ahead, Kate. Biggest obstacle. I mean, people have mentioned a lot of them, certainly the charging network and how you get it put in place, how you get it to people who don't have their own driveways or their own homes is a, a problem that we don't seem to be able to wrap our heads around yet. Somehow, I'm sure we will, but it's it's challenging. So that's a big one. Um, I think the second one Janelle just kind of referenced, which is that even for us here in Boston, very different situation from California, completely different situation from large parts of the middle of the country. People are required because of the economics of housing and because of where jobs are located and because of how zoning and land use has been set up to drive long distances to get where they need to go. It's often not really a choice. It, it's a false choice or it's a fake choice. Um, and that that's a huge challenge. And certainly in New England, where I am, most towns have exactly zero interest in densifying or doing any of the things that would need to be done to make destinations closer to each other, which is really what needs to happen to, to make people drive less or to encourage people to drive less. Um, I think that the third thing I would say, this is a little slightly different direction, but we have been trying, we sort of collectively have been trying for a long time to reduce emissions related to transportation, whether through government incentives to purchase vehicles, you know, we've tried all kinds of different things. They have almost entirely been carrots, regardless of what state you're talking about, regardless of whether you're talking about the federal government or state government. That is in large part because anything that challenges Americans' right to drive as much as they want or to increase the cost of doing so is immensely politically unpopular. Both because in a lot of people, a lot of people's cases, it's, it's like really unaffordable for them or could really be like damaging, but also just because it's very core to the American identity. I think we have we are rapidly approaching the place where we're gonna, we're gonna have to start to shift to a more like stick approach because we are just not going to meet any of those numbers that we saw at the beginning, anywhere close. Every state is dreaming when they put out these numbers. So that's more of a sort of policy approach challenge that elected officials are going to have to confront and deal with, as are all of us. Um, but I'm waiting for the sort of first, the first governor to stand up and be like, you know what, I'm really going to make gas a lot more expensive because I think it's the thing that has to happen. Um, has not happened yet. Thank you. I, I can answer Robin? that word from home question if somebody wants me to, but 
<laughs> Robin, thank you, Kate. Uh, so that's why I wanted Kate to go first, because ditto all of that. So Kate, if you want to take the question in the chat, I'll turn it back to you. Sure. So I, I, so it's, I think it's about, it's about work from home, right? So we, we tend to think of work from home as trips not made, um, which is great. Again, so long as you're not impacting your quality of life, your economy, the reasons why people move around. I think there are, there may be emissions positives to having people not commute for work. There are obviously economic negatives for downtowns and for small businesses and for restaurants. And, you know, it's not there. There are pros and cons in sort of different sectors of our society, but they're they're both there. Um, the theory has always been, and we're now running a, a real life experiment, um, that people who work from home actually make more trips because they are not encouraged to consolidate and sort of efficientize their trips the way they are if most of what they're doing is based around a kind of commute loop. We're, you know, we needed more data to see if that turns out to actually be the case. Um, but what I would expect is that people make more shorter trips during the day rather than one larger trip during the commute periods that then may have like little offshoot trips. But that's, we'll see. I think we still need more years to really know. I'll just say I can we confirm are... that. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say I can confirm that from my sample size of one. Um, and to the to the point of sort of shifting where money is being spent. Um, so I I live in Manhattan, definitely downtown, and and the the places that I'd say are probably more chain based restaurants that really catered to the commuting crowd are definitely struggling. But the awesome small restaurants in my own neighborhood and in many home neighborhoods are are doing much better because even if um, I do eat out. It, it's going to be closer to home, but I'm finding I am taking more of these like pop out, do a quick thing, go run an errand, um, go get bagels, go do whatever during during the day, as opposed to like, well, I already have a trip I need to take the commute and that's sort of draining in and of itself. And once I've done that, I really don't want to do anything else. Go ahead, Janelle, sorry. Yeah, I would just add that that's what we're all about is getting the data and figuring all this out. So we've surveyed super users, we've interviewed them, and we've also looked at gasoline consumption and travel patterns. And I can tell you that 63% of super users do commute. Um, there is a smaller percent who work from home, but it's much, much smaller. Um, and in our interviews, we generally found that super users were highly dependent on gasoline to navigate their lives. Um, and so for, for super users anyway, they, they really struggle to, they're, they're really working from home is not an option or not, I should say, not using lots of gasoline is not an option. Um, in our interviews, we got some very great, rich ethnographic data about people who were like, yeah, maybe they had a 40 mile commute, but they also had to drive their husband to his work because they only have one car and they had to go um, take, their son has to go to the hospital from time to time. And, you know, there were all sorts of stories about why they're doing all this driving but none of these things were optional. Like they were giving up things like Thanksgiving with their family. Um, there were people taking on a roommate just to pay for the gas. Um, so they really, the, the message was pretty loud and clear that they're stuck. Um, they don't really have an option to, to not use all that gasoline. <clears throat> Thank you, Janelle. Um, and now I would like to um, spend some time to compare and contrast the, the highest priority um, the policies and programs that have, you know, that are being considered or have been put in place on the East Coast versus the West Coast. Um, can can I ask Kate or, and or Robin to start with that? What have been the I'd like to talk about solutions now, right? What are the the highest priority policies or or programs? I mean, I, I can speak to Massachusetts, which I think is probably the leader of the New England states. Um, we're also quite different. We're much more populous and, and denser. Um, I, you know, I, I can't say that we've struck upon anything particularly brilliant. Um, we, our legislature appropriates a small subsidy that matches the federal subsidy when it exists to purchase EVs. Occasionally it runs out of money and we'll go several years without money. Most of the studies we've done have shown that the subsidies are actually inequitable and only good to people who are going to buy EVs anyway. So not so great. Um, you know, I think everybody's 
in a tizzy about what to do about charging, who should pay for it, should it be public, should it be private, who should own it, who should maintain it, what do we do, why is it never working? I don't think we have any good answers to that. I don't, I think the money from the infrastructure bill will help, but it won't be quite the transformative change that I think people were hoping for. Um, I do think we have made, this is a slight shift, but over the last 20 years, things move slowly in the transportation world. We have seen an enormous shift in um, increase in much safer, not perfect, but much safer facilities for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, and given we are we are similar to some of the statistics that were quoted earlier, I think 30% of the trips made in Middlesex County, which is where I am currently sitting, um, are under three miles, which is a distance that many people, um, not everybody, but many people can walk or bike if they're given safe facilities to do so. And we are seeing a shift. It, VMT is still going up, but it's probably going up more slowly than it would um, if those didn't exist. So I think we, like everybody, have not really cracked this nut yet, unfortunately. But maybe Robin will tell me what the answer is. <laughs> oh, I wish I knew. Um, so first, I need to start with a disclaimer. I'm going to talk a bit about what I've seen in, in New York and some of my previous experience at NYSERDA, but I uh, do not speak for the state of New York. I do not. I no longer work for them. So just need to put that out there. But um, I think some of the um, really great work that that I saw, and, and this sort of actually touches a little bit on Janelle's comment of like, there were goals of just deploying EVs or getting a certain amount of, of ZEVs more broadly um, out there. So New York, like a dozen or so other states, um, it has signed the ZEV MOU following um, the, the stricter standards that have come out of California through their Air Resources Board. So with the joint utilities, um, a few years ago, uh, the Department of Public Service adopted a make ready order. And that was primarily for light duty level two charging infrastructure that would blanket the state with the charging that would be needed to accommodate the ZEB goal, um, which is, I want to say 850,000 by 2025, something around there. Um, don't quote me on that, even though this is being recorded. Uh, but it was really largely focused on light duty EV charging. So that kind of proceeding requires public comment period. And there is overwhelming feedback of what about medium and heavy duty? What about things that aren't vehicles, alternatives to driving, other mobility options? And what about um, environmental justice communities? So the response to that and those categories of feedback was to allocate some of that make ready order to launch a series of three uh, large scale prizes that were focused on soliciting uh, ideas from from market actors open statewide um, and the grand prize awards were ranged between seven and ten million dollars and each of the three prizes was kind of in the bucket of mobility, EJ communities, and then medium and heavy duty. Um, so there was a really um, tremendous opportunity to concentrate resources in the winning communities, whereas previous investments that state agencies had made were in the like half million dollar range, let's say, for small scale pilots, which then reached a challenging point of the grant money's out, now what? And if you're lucky, you're scrappy and you're out there applying to the next thing and the next thing, and you maybe get it and you're able to scale or at least sustain operations of the thing that you initially piloted. But the majority of those kind of went away once the money dried up. Um, and in some cases, they had to like rip out infrastructure because they maybe had a subscription and like, who's going to pay for this <laughs> once the grant expires? So recognizing that and... Um, recognizing that the make ready order didn't yet cover all the things, um, but that we weren't yet uh, as a market ready to say, these are the winners, or this is the, the solution that needs, you know, a, almost a billion dollars behind it. We need a little bit of, of piloting and demo work and market intel first. Um, that I think was a really innovative way to address some of the gaps and see what the communities and uh, industry actors were recommending. Now they're in the kind of deploy, evaluate, see what's working or not pivot phase. 
so that the next tranche of big funding can say, from that we learned, we really need to put big money behind X, Y, and Z. And now they can go and do that at a large scale. Um, so hopefully, I mean, it's, it's still early phase in those um, prize projects, but hopefully that leads to an opportunity to um, really put funding behind something that's going to be impactful rather than trying to um, sprinkle the money. And yeah, a lot of different locations get some sort of incentive, but it's not really enough to have a transformational impact in any one place. Thank you, Robin. I think we certainly learned a lot from, from that particular experience. Um, what about the West Coast? Um, uh, Janelle and John, could you comment on the sort of highest uh, priority policies or, and or programs? I've got a number, but Janelle, if you want to go first. I'll just uh, talk about the ones that we're working on. So we passed a law in Washington State that um, set aside a budget to do a study of super users with an eye towards revising the EV incentive program to maybe prioritize the super users for EV incentives. Um, the report from that study is due to come out later this summer, so we'll see how, how Washington State goes. Um, in California, we advanced a bill that would provide um, an extra EV incentive for people who are super users, and, uh, for who are lower income super users. I forgot to mention, so um, the majority of super users are below the median household income. And so there's a nice equity component to focusing on super users, especially lower income, su income super users and helping them shift to EVs first. So that's what this California bill uh, aimed to do. And it made it through its first two committees with unanimous support which means that Republicans in this divided partisan world voted for a bill, <laughs> um, which was pretty <laughs> exciting. So they, um, um, super users are two to one rural. And so I think the folks in these more uh, right leaning districts who have a lot of rural drivers kind of understood from our data that these are these super users, that's where they're concentrated and they're really gonna benefit from um, added incentives. Um, one other bill that is uh, hopefully going to get signed into law tomorrow that's not on the West Coast is in Vermont, and it's exciting because it, for the first time, authorizes a utility to use ratepayer money to incentivize super users in Vermont to switch to EVs. Um, super users switching to EVs are utilities' best customers, right, because they're going from uh, using whatever electricity they're using to suddenly pretty much three times that amount um, if they're a super user. So, this is exciting. It will be the first time in the world such a law were passed. And I think once utilities see the benefit of incentivizing super users to switch um, on their bottom line, uh, we might see a lot more of this in other states. Thank you, John. Yeah, I, I got a bunch, so I'll try to rattle them off quick. But uh, so, of course, we've <clears throat> Ban the sale of um, ICE cars, of, of gas cars in California after uh, 2035. Um, by the way, this gets painted as extreme by some people. And if, if you're unaware, Canada has done the whole country uh, the same thing. And all 28 states of the, East, the, of the European Union, as well as I think uh, Singapore, and I don't know, there's like eight or nine other countries. So. 2035. That's we're we're not we're not leading. We're kind of on the mark. If anything, lagging. So uh, so anyway, banning the sale of uh, of gas cars uh, is is obviously uh, beneficial. Um, the uh, requirement. Um, California passed a rule that all new single family homes must have a dedicated circuit wired in the garage. 100% of new homes have to have a circuit in the garage that can be used for charging. And the number for multifamily is much lower, but we're pushing for that to be uh, brought up so that everybody can charge in, uh, in multifamily as well. I think um, other things that are sort of not directly in regulatory, but um, the utilities have programs where you'll get something in your bill that says if you switch out your water heater to a Energy Star version, you know, there's a rebate and things like that. And there are um, consultancies who manage all that uh, for the utilities. So there's, uh, and a lot of the money that the utilities use to promote uh, kind of cleaner appliances and things like that does ultimately come from uh, government programs. And so uh, I think 
programs like that are um, are extremely valuable uh, in helping. I do think uh, I want to cover two other quick things. First of all, community action is incredible. And um, there's a lot of community groups. There's electric vehicle clubs. And uh, the one that I was volunteering in is still very active. And anytime there's like a 5K or 10K run, a bunch of volunteers come in with EVs and park them and give kind of tours. And you can walk around and see 10, 15 different models of EVs, talk to the owners, understand their range and issues and what's the benefits and drawbacks of each one. And so those community kind of outreach is just phenomenal in, uh, in getting things out there. And then, um, yeah, I think at the macro level, to be honest, I actually think at the federal level, we need to be helping people in the fossil fuel industry to transition. And I think the fact that with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, there's been a lot of private activity now. There's uh, new battery plants going in in Georgia and, uh, and the Carolinas. So we've just got a lot of activity where we're bringing a lot of manufacturing of EVs and electric vehicle components and the batteries and so on into, you know, different parts of the country so that you're now creating, you know, just more jobs for people. And I think that reduces the inertia that we're getting. There's just so much blowback and inertia on, on this transition, and we have to somehow plow through that. Uh, thank you, John. Um, so we we are running a little bit behind uh, in, on time. So I'm going to skip the next question. Actually, go directly to our last two topics uh, for the evening. Um, so, so the next topic is affordability. This is something that uh, Robin ha had touched upon um, earlier um, this evening. Um, and my question is, you know, people. Many people, yeah, I guess, usually associate EVs with you know premium products, you know Teslas and whatnot, uh, expensive. I mean, my question is, how can we make EVs affordable uh, for everyone? So maybe can I ask Janelle to take this first, and then we we'll ask someone from the East Coast to um, respond. Sure. I mean, I touched on this a little bit, but the people who we really most need to switch to EVs to cut gasoline use the fastest are the ones who have the most compelling economic case already. Um, you know, people say you can't afford an EV. Well, for these super users, you can't afford gasoline, you know. Um, and I'll just also say that if you're, you know, hooked on gasoline, if you're reliant on gasoline, anytime there's a gas price spike, like we saw in last summer, um, and you're a super user, suddenly you're taking on two, three more jobs. I mean, like, it's a big deal. Um, so, so there's that. And then, um, uh, I just think with, the, well, super users also have older vehicles that have a lot more miles on them and they tend to break down. And that can be a financial shock to families. In fact, there was a Pew Trust research uh, piece that said that this was like the number one financial shock for folks. Um, and so part of the whole economic picture is shifting from this, um, if you're a super user, from high prices that also are very volatile and can be even higher, um, and also the kind of unreliability of your vehicle to a much more predictable EV car payment, uh, you know, and electricity, which yes, it's been going up a bit, especially in California, but but not near as much as the volatility of gas prices. Thanks, Janelle. And would uh, Robin or Kate like to address the afford affordability question? I'll quickly touch on a, a program that, that we administer in California. So sort of to the earlier question of uh, good programs we've seen, um, in some cases, even with the incentives that are out there, so all the carrots that Kate mentioned, there still is a, a, a delta and financing that would be needed for personal ownership. So there's a program in California that actually enables communities to deploy shared mobility options. So uh, an opportunity for people to get access to clean modes, even if they can't afford it themselves, or they may have other mobility limitations that um, impact their ability to drive. So it's a program called Clean Mobility Options. 
and it's through the Air Resources Board, and it provides both funding and technical assistance for underserved communities to complete a needs assessment to figure out what are their gaps, what solution would work best given their current uh, local conditions, and then seed funding to pilot a service. So it could be micromobility, it could be car share, van pool, or microtransit, but it's up to the communities to identify what would best suit their need and then to deploy something that is a clean mode. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Robin. Yeah, Daniel, I would if I could just chime in, I would just highlight that driving an EV, so you save around $2,000 a year. And the expectation is that by, by uh, early next year, purchasing an EV will actually be price, the same price competitive as purchasing a, uh, a gasoline car. Right, so, price of the um, EVs are coming down. Is, and, the, and the key is, you know, charging at home is way cheaper than charging out in public. So you get right. the lowest rates when you're at home. So um, we're, by the way, big focus for us is on affordability. And um, we, uh, uh, we have a number of properties, you know, because we're focused on multifamily. Uh, actually, there's quite a bit of affordable housing that is, um, you know, in, in multifamily. So we focus on um, programs. Uh, there's also used EVs on the market, so we're, we focus on educating, you know, people living in affordable housing that you could be saving a fortune on maintenance and on uh, and on fuel um, by switching to an EV. And so that's a you know a big part of what we're all about. So I, right. I, think, I, I was going to this is mostly mm -hmm. an education thing, and and <laughs> so sure. Uh, I was going to ask you, John. Um, about you know the the cost analysis, right? For somebody who lives in the apartment, obviously you know doesn't it, it, it has to sort of uh, rely on a shared charging infrastructure. Um, I mean, uh, you know, when you communicate um, cost to that person, what does it look like? Yeah, so to the uh, to the well, we sell to the property owner, so that's a whole different conversation. But yeah. Uh, but but yeah, to to the resident, uh, generally speaking, you save around sixty percent um, on gasoline uh, when you can uh, when you can charge electricity at home. So uh, it costs around, you know, to to fill up is like ten dollars, uh, roughly speaking. Um, so uh, and then yeah the the consumer reports the uh, ma the savings on maintenance is around uh, uh, fifty dollars a month uh, it, it nets out to al almost six hundred dollars a year savings on maintenance so that's you know that's a big part of what we uh, what we communicate. Thank you, John. Um, down to my very last question for the evening before we go into the breakout rooms. Um, and the question is on accessibility and reliability, right? So the question is, how do we make charging accessible for everyone, um, especially those who don't have a level two charger at home? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, I can start on that. You know, I, I think, um, uh, Making uh, so first of all, public charging is unreliable. This is going to turn into a sales pitch, so I got to be careful. Uh, uh, public charging, uh, the the cords uh, do often break, and the the J plug breaks. So it's better when you charge at home. You take better care of you know the cords, and then our particular unit doesn't have a cord. You use the one that comes with a car, or you supply your own. So. Um, I, uh, so we try to, you know, maximize the uh, the reliability in that way. I would note that EVs tend to be more reliable. They have about 80% fewer moving parts than a gasoline car. So you're already in a in in better shape there, uh, just because the the amount of maintenance and the the reliability is better better there as well. Okay. Thank you so much, John. Um, one thing I you mentioned about level two charging, I just want to mention level one is great. You get you know 
the average amount you drive each day is 40 miles, and overnight you can charge around 60 miles just by plugging into a regular outlet. So we, you know, that that it's it's completely viable. Uh, uh, and then you know when you're taking a longer trip, you can just swing by a you know public charger. Right, and that's it's probably better for the battery too. Um, compared to supercharging your car all the time. Right. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thank you for um, all of our panelists. Um, and now we'll go into our breakout room session for Q&A and um, for more detailed discussions. Uh, Marie, could you please send us to our respective breakout rooms?